The simultaneous equation approach is another way of calculating a mediation model. How this approach works is that we take the mediation model as one large model and instead of estimating the regressions of y and m separately, we derive the model implied covariance matrix. I will be using the correlation metric here for simplification, but in practice we work with covariances nearly always. So we, we look at, for example, the correlation between x and y. We find that we can go from x to y using two different paths. We go from x through m to y and we go from x to y directly. So that gives us two ways or, or two elements. We have uh, the mediation effect beta m1 times beta y2 plus the direct effect beta y1. Similarly, we can calculate the correlation between y and m. It is uh, the direct path and it is this uh, spurious correlation due to x that is a common cause for both. And that gives us uh, the correlation between m and, m and y here. <coughs> How we estimate this model is that <coughs> we calculate, we, we find the betas so that the data correlation matrix and model implied correlation matrix are as close as one another as possible. To understand the calculation, we have to first take a look at the degrees of freedom because that is important for this particular problem. The degrees of freedom for this uh, model is calculated based on uh, these correlations because we only use information from the correlations. We don't look at the individual observations. Our units of information, the data, we have uh, five correlations that depend on the model parameters. Importantly, the, the variance of x doesn't count because that doesn't depend on any of the model parameters. So we have these five elements, variance of m, variance of y, and all the correlations that depend on, on the model. So we have five units of data. Then we have uh, five things that we estimate. We have five free parameters. We have uh, three regression coefficients here. And then we have these two variances, variance of this error term and variance of that error term. So we estimate five different things and uh, the decrease of freedom for this model is then zero because it's the difference between these two. And we say that this is a just identified model the just identified means that we can estimate the model but we are using all the information from the data to estimate the model and we could not add anything more to the model. It also means that the model will fit perfectly and what that means I will explain a bit later in the video. So we have a just identified model. It means that we can find the values of, of these variances and the betas so that our the model implied correlation matrix matches exactly the data correlation matrix. We can do that, for example, using the Lavan package in R. So Lavan gives us output. You can do the same with the SCM command in Stata. And uh, the output it contains, uh, importantly, two different sections. So we have uh, estimation information. And uh, this is not particularly useful because our decrease of freedom is zero. We can do model testing. If we had positive decrease of freedom, we could test the model and I'll talk more about that later in the video. And then we have uh, these coefficients. So we have regressions. We have uh, regressions of, of y on m and x. So that's beta y1 and beta y2. Then we have regression of, of m on x, that's beta m1. And then we have these estimated error variances uh, ym and, and yu, yu and ym, that way. So we get the estimates here, we get the standard errors here, we get the t, the, uh, these are z values, they are not t values because this is based on large sample theory and then we get p values for these, these estimates. Then we can also calculate using this package the mediation effect. So we define that into the model. So that's something that uh, the software will calculate for automatically. The standard error, the z value and the p value for the standard error. And then we have uh, the total effect which is uh, the effect of x on y that goes directly and x on m through m. So that's a total effect. Total effect is influence of x on y regardless of whether it goes directly or through m. And then the direct effect is just beta y1. So that gives us the estimates and uh, 
and how it actually then works if we want to test uh, a partial mediation model. So importantly these estimates will be the exact same that you get from regression analysis. If you estimate this model separately using regressions uh, then uh, you will get the exact same results. There will be differences once we start to estimate models that are over identified. For example if we estimate directly a full mediation model so we're saying that there is no path from x to y. Estimate a model where we assume that all effects of x to m, x to, to y go through m. And uh, we apply tracing rules again. We can see that the uh, equations are a bit simpler here because we only go from uh, x to y using this one path, beta m1, beta y2. So there's no direct path anymore from uh, x to y. So it's only this product. And uh, this uh, has a positive decrease of freedom. So the, uh, the data are the same. So we have five units of data, but we now only have four parameters that we estimate. So we have two regression coefficients and two error variances. Then the decrease of freedom is the difference. So we have uh, one degree of freedom and we call this over identified model. The problem or a feature, whether you like want to call it that, is of these over identified model is that generally we cannot make the model implied correlation matrix to exactly equal the data correlation matrix. Instead of making those <coughs> those uh, the same and, and solving we have to uh, make the model implied correlation matrix as close as possible to the data correlation matrix. So uh, to do to make that model implied correlation matrix as close as possible to data correlation matrix we have to define what we mean by close. So we have to define uh, how we quantify the distance between this, how, how different the model implied correlation matrix is from the data correlation matrix. This problem of, of quantifying the difference between these two matrices is uh, comparable to the regression analysis. So in the regression analysis uh, we use a discrepancy function. So we calculate the difference between the regression line and the actual observations and to do that we calculate the residual, so the difference between the line and the observations. We take, the, take squares of residuals. The idea of taking squares is that we want to uh, avoid having a uh, large estimation, large prediction errors. So we are okay with small prediction errors but we want to avoid having large prediction errors. Then we take a sum of these squares and that gives us the ordinary, ordinary least squares estimate. We minimize that gives us the regression coefficient. In path analysis we calculate the difference between each unique cell in the observed correlation or covariance matrix and the model implied correlation or covariance matrix. We raise those differences to the second power. The idea again is that we want to avoid uh, having models that explain some parts of the data really badly and we are kind of okay with models that are slightly off compared to the data. Then we sum these differences and uh, these square differences and that provides the unweighted least squares estimator. There, <coughs> there's another parallel between our path analysis and regression analysis. So besides minimizing the discrepancy function and that gives us uh, estimates that, that are in some way ideal, then uh, the discrepancy can be used to quantify the goodness of fit of the model. So the R square, one definition of R square in regression analysis is based on this sum of squares. So we calculate the sum of squares regression and then we compare that to the total sum of squares and that gives us R square. Then uh, here we have uh, the sum of squares uh, of these covariance errors and that can be used to quantify the model fit as well. Let's take a look. So I estimated on uh, information. There's estimation information again. We have uh, one degree of freedom for this full mediation model and we have a p-value uh, that is significant, that is non-significant. I'll, I'll go through that p-value shortly. So the idea and then we have the estimates here. The idea of uh, the p-value is that it quantifies how much different the uh, actual observed correlation matrix is from the implied correlation matrix. So the difference between this uh, observed correlation matrix and this model implied correlation matrix is called 
the residual correlation matrix. So it's the, again, there's a parallel to regression analysis where we have residuals. When we work with uh, raw observations like in the regression analysis, the residual is the difference between actual observations and predictive value. Here, when we work with correlations, the residual is the difference between uh, a predicted correlation and observed correlation. So this residual correlation matrix here is basically uh, the observed correlations minus the implied correlations. You can verify that it, it actually is the case here. So the question uh, that the p-value here answers whether uh, this small correlation here can be by chance only. So is it possible that the sampling error in the observed correlation matrix produces that kind of discrepancy? That's close to zero, so we can say that that's probably due to chance. But if it was far from zero, then we would know that this model doesn't adequately explain the correlation between x and y. And uh, we would probably conclude that uh, x has also a direct effect of y. So it would be a partial mediation instead of a full mediation model that we specified here. So that's the, uh, the test here. The p-value of about 0.7 indicates that uh, getting this kind of effect by chance only is plausible. So normally, and this is called, this is called an over-identification test because uh, we have one degree of freedom. We are testing whether that one degree of freedom is consistent with what we have in the model. And uh, we want to uh, accept the chi-square test. We want to accept the null hypothesis here. The reason is that normally in the regression analysis, we are interested in show, showing that uh, the null hypothesis that coefficient is zero is not supported because we usually want to say that there is an effect. Now we want to say that there is no difference between the model implied matrix and the actual matrix. So we are saying that uh, the model implied matrix is, fits well to the, to the data. And therefore we can conclude that the model implied matrix is in some sense correct and the model is in some sense correct. So we want to accept the null hypothesis. If we reject the null hypothesis, then we conclude that this model is inadequate for the data and uh, we shouldn't make much inferences based on the model estimates. Instead, we should be looking at why the model doesn't explain the data well and perhaps adjust the model. For example, add the direct path from X to Y. Now, this is uh, <coughs> here we have just one statistic. So we could be just comparing this statistic against uh, an appropriately chosen normal distribution. We don't do that. Instead, we use the chi-square test. The reason is that for more complicated models or more complex models, there are typically more than one element of this residual correlation matrix that is non-zero. So when we ask the question of can this uh, small difference be by chance only, we, we can take a look at the normal distribution and how far from zero the estimate is. And that gives us the p-value. If we have, uh, so that gives a z-value, estimate divided by standard de deviation or estimate divided by the standard error. If we have two cells here that are different from zero, then uh, we have to do a test that these both are zero at the same time. So we are looking at, uh, at the plane. So instead of looking at, at one variable, we look at two variables and how far they are from, from zero. And you may remember from our earlier video that in this case, uh, or from your math class in high school, this distance is calculated by taking a square of uh, this coordinate and a square of this coordinate, taking a sum and then taking a square root. In practice, uh, we don't take the square root because we can just uh, use a reference distribution that takes the square root into account. So we have uh, the square of this uh, estimate and square of this estimate, we take a sum and that gives us uh, the, the chi-square stat statistic. So the chi-square is the sum of two uh, normally distributed random variables when both have a uh, sum of squares of two normally distributed variables when uh, both have mean of zero. So the, uh, the null hypothesis is that both of these are zero then uh, the distribution is chi-square, so we take uh, one 
random variable normally distributed centered at zero. We square that, we take another one, we square that, we take a sum and that gives us the reference distribution. So it's uh, basically there's a parallel again, minimize the sum of squared residuals. Well we want to minimize the, the sum of squares of these uh, differences and uh, we quantify these uh, the difference by looking at the actual sum of squares. So we take uh, squares of these estimate and standard error which is the variance and that gives us the chi-square statistic. So the logic is that instead of comparing just one statistic against uh, a normal distribution we compare the sum of squares estimate of the est uh, sum of squares of two differences against the, the sum of squares of two normally distributed variables. If uh, it's plausible that a random process of two normally distributed variables could have produced the same distance then we conclude that this is could be by chance only.